Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 173, Another Case of Identity. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Boulder. And we are going to be with you over the course of the next hour to slowly reveal what happened over 40 years ago at a certain Sherlockian society meeting that was a scandal at the time and is now looked on with great mirth and frivolity. Uh, Stay tuned. We'll be with you about that topic in just a moment. In the meantime, you can find the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash ihose173. You can reach us on all the socials at ihearofsherlock. You can email us at comment at ihearofsherlock.com. Let us know what you thought of this episode or others. And, of course, you can call us at 774-221-READ. Again, that's 774-221-7323. And before we get into our interview, we actually did want to acknowledge that we did have a phone call in this last cycle. You know, we chided you for not calling us as often. You know, you don't send us flowers anymore. But in this case, we had a call. And we'd like to share that with you right now. Hi, Bert and Scott. I, uh... Don't really actually have anything to say. Uh, this is Antonio from New Jersey, big, uh, big fan obviously of both podcasts. Uh, but it is more just a curious piece to find out if you guys actually still have this number set up. Yeah. Kind of like when, uh, they have to mention a, a number in a movie or television that doesn't start with 555. Curiosity gets the best of them sometimes. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing. Keep up the great work. Have a good one, guys. I like that. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah. Well, more people need to uh, dial up that number and leave us some words that say they're listening because that's cheerful and uh, very welcome. And please do. It is. Thank you very much for that, Antonio. And for someone who didn't have anything to say, I think you said plenty. Sure. So, you know, I, I always have to wonder when a message starts out with uh, someone saying, well, I don't, I don't really have a reason for calling. Or, or, or some other similar salvo. And, and I wonder, okay, where's this leading? And you know what? It usually turns out to be a great conversation. So uh, we're grateful that you uh, sent us that message, Antonio, and we hope you keep listening. We're pleased to welcome Rosemary Herbert to the program. Rosemary is editor in chief of the Oxford Companion to Crime and Mystery Writing and author of Front Page Teaser, a Liz Higgins mystery. She's a former Harvard University reference librarian and a longtime journalist and literary critic, whose books also include Who Done It, a Who's Who in Crime and Mystery Writing, Murder on Deck, Shipboard and Shoreline Mystery Stories, and 12 American Crime Stories. Also, she co-edited with Tony Hellerman the Oxford Book of American Detective Stories and The New Omnibus of crime. After residing on a main island, she now lives in America's heartland, where she pursues writing 
and ceramic arts. Rosemary, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me come along. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Well, there is a lot to unpack in that short bio, and uh, we we do want to get to uh, a number of those things. But why don't we start where we start with all of our guests, and that is asking you about how you first encountered Sherlock Holmes. Well, I first encountered Sherlock Holmes um, thanks to my best friend's mom. Um, We had been, I and my best friend Susan, had been reading, of course, all the Nancy Drew mysteries. And I was probably about eight or nine years old when I was given the annotated Sherlock Holmes by um, this this, um, uh, lovely woman whose name was Beatrice Crone. Um, She thought that I would enjoy this and and she even wrote in the front of this book, as she did in front of any book she gave me, may this bring you many hours of reading enjoyment. And huh. it certainly has. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. <laughs> I, was on, I was on the young side for some of this, but I was a good reader and uh, thoroughly uh, enjoyed poking into it. So that, that would have given you your first taste of the fact that in – the world, there were other people or there were people who were really into Sherlock Holmes, having dinners, forming societies and so on. When did you make your first connection to uh, other Sherlockians? Other Sherlockians? Ooh. Um, I think that, you know, if you think about other Sherlockians broadly, you would have found that just about um, anyone who was much of a reader and could read in English and probably in other parts of the world, um, the very many other parts of the world, but certainly in English, would have, have discovered Sherlock Holmes early on in their reading careers. He's just there. <laughs> um, so in terms of, you know, other people who loved the canon, um, that would have happened very early on. Um, in terms of belonging to any formal organization or group, that was interested in um, the great detective. I suppose that would have come that would have come significantly later. Um, but one of the things I did notice, as you know, I was formerly a Harvard University librarian. I was a reference librarian, but before that, I was a librarian who processed books that were donated to the Widener Library at Harvard University, oh, wow. their grand large library. We received book collections from largely from professors who had retired and from estates of people connected with the university. Over and over and over again amongst those collections, we found basic things. People had dictionaries, they had atlases, they had, you know, some some other uh, typical books uh, having to do with whatever their field of study was. But no matter what their field of study or interest, we always had some copies of Sherlock Holmes material oh. amidst anybody's collection, and it was so striking. In wow. fact, that kind of gives me a segue here because it was the connection with that that introduced me to um, Dan Posnansky, the great Sherlockian, um, who um, um, eventually set me on the path so that I could attend a Sherlockian dinner myself and become a member of... Um, various Sherlockian organizations. Yeah. Yeah, well you, you mention Sherlock Holmes and Harvard and and over mm-hmm. a certain time period, uh typically the seventies through the nineties, I would say, that would mean the mm-hmm. inevitable intersection with Dan Posnansky. So um Yes it was. It was exactly then. And um we were um as we processed books that were donated to the library of course, there were many that we already had copies of because Harvard was so wonderfully privileged to own so much. So what we did was to take books that had been uh, donated but which were not needed for the collection, and we um, sold them in a, an ongoing book sale. Hmm. And there were scholars like Dan Pesnance who came along and um, asked us, you know, if you, something comes along in this field or uh, produced by this author, or on this subject, um, would you let me know? And I will gladly come and purchase those books from you. And that's 
how I got to know Dan. Yeah. Um, it was at a point one time when he came in and I had found quite a few books for him along these lines because everyone had them in their collection. Um, Dan said to me, um, gee, Rosemary, it's too bad you're not a man. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's unusual. That's an interesting and, opening and line. He said, because, <laughs> because if you were, you could come to this wonderful dinner of Sherlockians <laughs> at the Speckled oh, Band of Boston. Right. right. So now, that was how that all developed. <laughs> yeah. Now, for those listeners who may not be familiar with Dan or the Speckled Band, we actually did an episode on the Speckled Band with Dan. Uh, that is episode 77, mm-hmm. and we will have a link to that in our show notes. Uh, and you can go back and listen to that and hear Dan. Uh, and, and we do want to return to this, to this subject with, with Dan and the Speckled Band, Rosemary, because it is one that spans, uh, decades and, and one, in fact, that reached its coda, uh, just this spring in, in 2019. Uh, so let's, let's put a, a pin in that for now. We'll come back to that in the second half of the show. Uh, but okay. we'd, we'd be really interested in uh, just your progression throughout the world of mysteries. That, you know, obviously, as as an eight or nine year old reading Nancy Drew, uh, or or you know, as as boys would typically do, read the Hardy Boys. It's not an uncommon thing. Uh, you were you were introduced to Sherlock Holmes early on, then, and in a very detailed way. The annotated typically isn't the first Sherlock Holmes book that most kids are. Exposed to, um, but no. <laughs> br- bring us along in your journey about how uh, other mysteries crept into your interest and 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 where that led you. Well, it was very interesting. Also, when I was quite young, um, I went to a book fair as we all do in our schools, and we're very fortunate to have these book fairs where children's books are offered. And I saved up my few dollars, which was at that time quite a bit of money. And I was going to buy some sort of, you know, child's book. I was probably about nine years old, again, in that same age group. And I saw a copy of something called The Haunted Looking Glass, which is ghost stories chosen by Edward Gorey, with illustrations by Edward Gorey. And that book looked so marvelous, and it was not there for children. It was for faculty and for adults who would also come to the book fair, along with other books for their age group. And it had this marvelous illustration. I have it here in front of me as I'm talking with you of a mirror draped with some kind of royal red cloth. And in the mirror is a ghostly figure. Um, and I saw that book and I thought, someday I will be a writer and I will have a book that looks as good as that <laughs> and as mysterious. Because I was already reading Nancy Drew and I liked the idea of mysteries. Um, it was around that same time that I wrote my first mystery, which was called The Mystery of the Mansion, and it was bound in uh, pieces of shirt cardboard, which we used to have those days. Our dads would have them from the uh, shirt cleaner, and um, uh, covered up with a uh, very rich, uh, probably cheap, but uh, I thought gorgeous-looking blue velvet covers, <laughs> and sewn together with heavy thread. Um, and this was a very imitative of the Nancy Drew genre, I must admit, um, with lots of um, screaming in the night and people getting locked up in rooms and making their way out. And the uh, main character of the, of the book, given a name that I thought it was very important not to be like any name I'd ever ha- heard before, because, of course, this was going to become a famous sleuth. Her name was Georgette Porp. <laughs> <laughs> P-O-U-R-P. <laughs> Obviously, her career didn't go beyond that book. But <laughs> I set out, I think I was in the fourth grade when I did that. So I'd have been about nine, ten years old. And then um, basically my whole life, as you know from the bio you've already read, has been centered around the world of books. Um, so... I dreamt of becoming a mystery writer, um, but I spent a lot of time professionally, um, not only working in libraries, but working as a journalist, freelance, and then as book review editor of the Boston Herald in Boston, Massachusetts, where I um, interviewed many writers about their works as they were coming out, including, I'm very pleased to say, 
very, very many terrific mystery writers, as well as mainstream writers and writers of nonfiction. So um, I was very fortunate to learn a lot about other people's um, methods of writing, what kept them going, how they uh, overcame certain kinds of uh, challenges in constructing a mystery. So I was very, very fortunate. What were what are some of those that you remember? I ask because over the years, as I've met various writers I've admired, in some cases I have been surprised by their the the disconnection between the quality of their prose and the worlds they describe and their actual personas. You know, when I when I would meet a couple of these people, a couple come to mind, I would say to myself, mm. "Boy, I never thought that." the author of XYZ would look uh-huh. like this, you know, would be like this, you know. And, uh, but what were you, so do you have any surprises and who, who who stands out in your memory among the folks you've interviewed? Well, um, of course, I, I especially am grateful to P.D. James, um, who has, I, I discovered her work actually in the Widener Library just before she became famous. And I sought her out for uh, writing something about her. I think it might have been in the Christian Science Monitor way back when I was work- working for them on a freelance basis. I don't remember quite clearly which first place it was. But um, as a result of my seeking her out before everyone else was in journalism, um, she always, I think, felt a little bit grateful for that. And um, I had... Uh, many opportunities to meet with her over the years. I uh, also served on some panel discussions with her at Oxford University and at other conferences. And um, later in in her life, I went to London and, uh, you know, pretty spur of the moment, let her know I was there because it had been a spur of the moment uh, trip. And um, she invited me to have lunch with her in the House of Lords. I was just over the moon about that. And what was great fun about that, not to mention being able to see activity within the chamber, which she did take me to, and then having lunch in lovely, lovely venue there for members of the House of Lords. But we also, in passing, went down the, the hallway there in, in, in Parliament, and there was Ruth Rendell, the other mystery writer of, of great fame and of her her time period, and the two of them stopped to discuss their two new kittens. <laughs> it was absolutely great. So, and other other people who became friends of mine include um, Tony Hillerman, with whom I edited some uh, anthologies, and um, uh, John Mortimer, who of course is the creator of Rumpole of the Bailey, and uh, quite a few others. I can give you um, an interesting um, anecdote um, that goes along with the first book that I ever put together, which was called The Fatal Art of Entertainment, Interviews with Mystery Writers. And um, in this book, I asked most of the mystery, all of the mystery writers whom I interviewed, um, whether or not they were people who were particularly sensitive to the fragility of life. I think that that's the case for me. I'm not grim. I'm not um, someone who's worried about, you know, dying at any point or something like that. But I think I've always been someone who's been sensitive to the fragility of it. I'm not sure why. Maybe most people are, but I kind of think that there are some people like me who are perhaps more aware of that, even from a young age. And so I asked a number of people that question and um each one of them came up with it with an answer. In fact, P.D. James was one who said, yes, you know, when I was a child, you know, I hear the rhyme of Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and I wondered, you know, did he fall or was he pushed? She even said that, you know, that these her someone would say in her family, we're going to the seaside. And she'd say that is if we're all alive for that in her mind. Now, that's a little more um, unusual than how I would feel. I just have always felt sort of appreciative to be alive. (laughs) But another really um, amusing moment was when I asked this question of Reginald Hill, and I said, by then I was rolling this question off my tongue, and Reginald Hill is another fabulous 
British mystery writer, and I said, Reginald, um, let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm asking everyone this. You know, are, do you think of yourself as someone who's particularly sensitive to the fragility of life? And he said, well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and a conversation stopper. <laughs> but he actually then did reveal that, um, yes, he felt, now that he thought about it, that he was because of an incident in his childhood. So, so it's been, it's been very fascinating to be able to ask people these questions and have them be very open with their answers. Hmm. Now, the Oxford Companion to Crime and Mystery Writing is, uh, it's really an undertaking. And uh, this is kind of the definitive guide to the world of mystery, if you will. And, oh, thank you for saying that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> um, and I, I just, I want to read the opening paragraph to it before we get to, uh, your experience with it, because I, I think it's just, it, it's just so picture perfect. Uh, it begins. Oh, thank you. It was a cold and wintry afternoon in Oxford, England, when the editors of the then nascent volume, which would come to be known as the Oxford Companion to Crime and Mystery Writing, concluded the meeting that would lay the groundwork for this book. After brainstorming about overarching principles of companion construction and individual topics to be included, the editors crammed themselves companionably into a single elevator while continuing to converse about the project that had brought them together. Although the elevator doors closed in a normal way, the passengers soon noticed that the elevator itself did not stop where they expected, but descended beyond their chosen floor. All conversation stopped as the doors opened upon a solid stone wall, offering absolutely no egress. In unison came the cry, For the love of God, Montresor! <laughs> <laughs> well, what a what a great sense of humor you all must have had in, uh, in undertaking that project. And how is it that you all uh, came together? Tell us about the origins of this uh, amazing undertaking. Well, I was very fortunate um, that um, I, you know, lots of times the people who um, are chosen to edit uh, large and comprehensive volumes like this for Oxford University are actually on faculties of universities. But at the time, I was uh, a, a librarian, reference librarian at Harvard University. And I, for another reason, was in contact with a woman called Linda Halverson, who was a development editor at Oxford University Press. And I had been, for the purposes of the Boston Herald, interviewing her about some projects that Oxford University Press was doing. And I was also involved in um, doing some work uh, about various things to do with the dictionaries at Oxford University. So I was involved with a number of editors um, there. And I just, we were having lunch in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I said, you know, I think the time has come for an Oxford companion to crime and mystery writing. And she said, Oh, really? Would you imagine would do that? And I, uh, <laughs> gamely piped up, well, I would. And, um, so she said, well, do send me your credentials and some, um, information about yourself and we'll see what we can do. Now I knew at the time that, um, not being on a faculty, but being a librarian, while that was a distinguished place to be a librarian, might be useful if I had some additional help with this. So hmm. I wrote to the man who wrote Bloody Murder, A History of Crime and Mystery Writing. His name was Julian Simmons. People may think it's Simons, S-Y-M-O-N-S. And um, the late Julian uh, Simmons um, uh, said, uh, he, sure, he would write a letter to Oxford University Press to let them know his view of my capabilities for this. Hmm. And to my joy and and I'm sure it sealed my opportunity to do this. He wrote, Rosemary Herbert knows as much as anyone in the United States about crime and mystery writing. And that did it. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, and he was someone I had also met through interview, interviewing him uh, to promote um, his work and my excitement about his work. And I think he appeared in one of my articles in 
a publisher's weekly and li- or a library journal. I wrote for both of those publications. Ah. There you go. So it was through, through it really it was through what did we used to call networking, you know, and this was way before the internet and all of that, and just getting to know people and and um, having them have some sense of, of who I was. And people were wonderfully kind, showing an interest, not just in having their work or promoted by my interviewing them, but um, they were interested in me and therefore knew a little something about me as a result of these interactions, yeah. which was quite lovely. Yeah. Now, the uh, the companion uh, contains... Uh, you know, so much information uh, about the world of mystery and from, um, you know, biographies of, of characters from uh, the likes of, oh, I don't know, Inspector Morse to uh, even Mycroft mm-hmm. Holmes himself uh, and uh, mm-hmm. qualifications about various authors, uh, the, the history of the mystery genre. How did you and the editorial team determine exactly how wide and how deep you were going to go because this is this is the kind of thing that could still be uh that, that could still be uh under editing if if you really let it be so oh it absolutely could be because of course the field is just oh always growing exponentially right. um but what we did was that we realized quickly that if this were going to include a large number of authors it would soon become only a biographical dictionary and we wanted entries on uh, thematic um, and historic literary historical information also on related genres such as say the ghost story or types of sleuths like the gentleman sleuth so what we decided to do was to make a um, reasonable length for the the a number of pages that we had which was nearly 700 pages um, a reasonable length list of people who would get individual entries. And those would include writers and characters in, in crime and mystery writing. And then what we did was to make these, um, what you might think of as a group entry. So that, um, someone who might not be mentioned anywhere else might have a work of his or hers mentioned under kidnapping or under espionage fiction, or under something like um, the locked room mystery. We have also um, articles on things like um, loyalty and betrayal, fairy tales, even racism. Um, we have things on the um, uh, on prison, an, an entry on prisons. And one of my favorite entries is the one on red herrings. Um, because, of course, the red herring is a special term in, in crime and mystery writing, as we all know, as those who love this genre. It basically refers to the false or misleading clue. But actually, it was fun to determine and discover that the term was used as early as 1420 to refer to fish that took on a red color during the process of being cured by smoke. In 1686, the notion of drawing a red herring across the track referred to an attempt to divert attention from the real matter um, that, of the fox running there. Um, and so um, it was a staple of the detective novel to have a and detective short story to have a false or misleading clue. And it's great fun to find the background of a term like that. That's wonderful. Yes, it was great fun. So we had things, things, you know, what I guess we would look at is good curiosities as well as um, the expected things. I mean, of course, there's going to be an article on Hercule Poirot or Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Um, Dr. Watson. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So what do you, I mean, you're in such a unique position with all of this work behind you, your professional experience, your range of interests, your engagement in Sherlock Holmes, your knowledge of the mystery writers. What what's your sense of the genre? You know, if someone asked you, you know, Rosemary, um, what's the current state of detective fiction and where what trends do you see? What would your answer be? I think what I would see is something that is is um, remarkably lasting. This has been going on for now oh, at least a couple of decades, more like three 
the great explosion of the regional voice and the regional detective um, novel. Um, this type of a, of, of a work where the setting and the regionality of it, the distinct properties of it, are are crucial to the development of the story, the atmosphere of the story, and often to the solution of it. Now, that's there's been regional writing long ago, um, but the explosion of it um, uh, presently is is uh, I think a very exciting feature because there's room for all kinds of um, enrichment to the story. You know, many years ago, um, I went to London years and years ago, and there were uh, the in this in this the tube or the subway. There's these very long escalators, and they have little posters going down, and they keep uh, repeating the ad so that you will really take it in by the time you're at the bottom of the or top of this escalator. And there was one that said, "Enter another world." Harrods, and it was for the Harrods department store. And I I never forgot it because it reminded me of what a mystery novel can do for you. You enter another world. Um, and you're not just looking at the clues and the, the character of the people involved in the crime or the sleuth, but you are entering another world, whether it's a traditional one, which now seems a long time ago, a 1920s novel, um, like a period piece, um, or whether it, it's a, a, a brand new work. Um, uh, I think that the regional development is, is quite, quite, quite wonderful. Yeah. That's it. You know, I had, a, I thought a little bit about that, but not to the extent you've just, um, so well described it. This morning, because today there was a note in the paper that um, Andrea Camilleri, who who was the author of the Inspector Montalbano series, passed away mm-hmm. in his nineties, and um, yeah, that certainly is a characteristic. And and with him, and Inspector Montalbano who was so heavily influenced by his early childhood, the particular little town in Italy he grew up in. Uh, mm-hmm. you, know, you see that in Donna Leone, you see that in. Um, and many other writers. That's um, very interesting. Well, an example is is something I just finished reading yesterday, and that is uh, a book by Delia Owens called Where the Crawdads Sing, and that is set in the marshlands of North Carolina and very, very marvelously drawn environment. Mm. Do, you um, think, do you think of... Um, non what do you think about non this is an odd word non traditional but non traditional authors of detective fiction for example william faulkner has wrote a series of short stories that are occasionally collected as detective fiction um you know other writers have i mean do you think um are there any non traditional detective fiction writers that have sort of popped up i mean michael well michael shaban really writes everything but, you know, he's done a couple mm. of uh, books that you could discuss as detective fiction. What do you, what do you think about people who, who drop into detective fiction uh, but have a different perspective on it? Um, I, I welcome that. Um, I think that um, it's always um, enjoyable to see someone. We see, you know, people from, who are known as, as uh, science fiction writers or others who – who will um, write um, something and try their hand at, at detective fiction. Um, we have actually in the Oxford Companion to Crime and Mystery Writing, we um, we also talk have an article on <laughs> just write what you're talking about, singletons we call them. And those are um, authors who have written only one book in the genre. I will refer to them as, as a singleton. And they may be known for other, other work, um, or they may be, um, just someone who only writes one book in their lifetime. And it happens to be a crime novel. So I think I, I welcome, um, all kinds of new perspectives being brought into the, the mystery novel. Are you, are you ever asked, um, top 10? You know, what do you think the greatest mystery novel is of all time? I mean, these are questions are so unfair, but every so often somebody pops up 
and says, well, you know, here's a new view. I tend to steer away from that because I think I agree with you that it is a bit of an unfair question. I mean, I suppose if you were to think about what were your favorites that keep coming to mind. But I think a mystery novel really can be important to you at one time in your life and uh, have a a special impact at that time, uh, which it might not have had at another time. I think, you know, I've read, of course, I've read very broadly because I've been a, a reviewer and interviewed many people. I'm not sure if I if I if I would commit to a top ten list of the best in in uh, but it's an interesting idea and I might think about it. <laughs> yeah. What do you good? Well, what do you go back to? What do you reread? I mean, every year, well, every couple of years, I tend to reread. Well, I shouldn't tell you what I tend to reread. What do you What do you? Or do- <laughs> I I reread um a, some I usually every summer read a. Co- Reread a couple of Nancy Drews. This year, I read um, uh, The Hidden Staircase um, and The Bungalow Mystery and The Mystery at Lilac Inn. I tend to go back to those, and I'm always amazed at, at really the variety of language that um, Carolyn Keene, uh, also it was Mildred Ward Benson, who wrote many of the books under that name, as you probably know, but the variety of language is quite amazing, really, for a young child um, who aspires to be a writer who just is enjoying reading. I can remember when I was a child, those books were considered to be uh, not something within every library because they were considered to be trash and not so literary. Well, I think they were literary enough. I mean, there was never anyone in it who used more ways of saying, she said, <laughs> than Carolyn Keene. She interposed. She interjected. Yeah. <laughs> she cried. Yeah. She that, exclaimed. Yeah, you know. I, I, dro- I drove I Elmore did. yeah, I drove Elmore Leonard Elmore Leonard crazy in that stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> Another person I, I go back to is uh, is Tony Huerman. Um and I do like to read the Rumpel stories. Because I love the idea of the familiar cast of characters interacting. And uh, as is the case also with, of course, the canon by Conan Doyle, um, these, these people become, the, the stories and the characters in them become very familiar to you and comforting. There's a real comfort in, in those, uh, in revisiting them. And mm. you feel as though it's become a part of your private landscape. Mm. Did you ever read, uh, well, you must have read this, but it's interesting to think about it for a second. Did you ever read that Thurber short story, The Macbeth Murder Mystery? That's, that's the one where somebody, that's the one where somebody is holed up on a holiday spot over the weekend and it's raining or something like that and there's nothing around and this person finished a great detective story and wants something else and the only thing that's available to read is Macbeth. (laughs) <laughs> and so Wonderful. they've just got a whole bunch of other per- permutations around what's really going on here. You know, I've got my eye on Banquo here. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back after hearing from our sponsor, we will continue the conversation with Rosemary and discover exactly how it is she managed to sneak into the speckled band of Boston decades ago and how that turned out for her. Stay tuned. People are always impersonating other people in the movies, like the mysterious Major Duncan Bleak in the Rathbone Bruce film Terror by Night. But what if Universal had made one more Sherlock Holmes feature? What if there was one more Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce adventure? Now you can find out in the Drury Lane Theater Mystery, an original Sherlock Holmes screen treatment by Dennis Hoey, the actor who starred as Inspector Lestrade in the series. Discovered in a forgotten cache of old Hollywood photographs and studio documents comes this previously unknown screen treatment, a backstage mystery set in London's famous Drury Lane Theater. And it includes additional material by Dennis Hoey's son, Michael, 
a Hollywood writer, producer, and director. This unique glimpse of the movie that might have been is available right now at wessexpress.com. Well, here's the reason I know a lot of people tuned into this program, uh, this particular episode. <laughs> we want to talk with Rosemary about uh, something that's been known uh, in a small group of circles, uh, a small circle of people uh, for the last, oh, I don't know, 40, 45 years or so. Uh, and it, it, it actually came to a head this spring because – um, we, you may have heard us discuss this before on the show that this spring in 2019, the Speckled Band officially made women, uh, members. They, of course, invited women to, uh, the dinner for the first time last year after, um, well, decades of being a stag outfit. Uh, and, and the reasons <laughs> behind, uh, waiting so long is because of a connection to the original founders and was done out of respect to, uh, their wishes. Um, but Rosemary had the honor this year of being tapped as the very first female member of the Speckled Band in a class of five women, uh, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the dinner program was accompanied by a little publication called A Second Adventure of the Speckled Band, which was written by R. Herbert Esquire. Uh, and it is uh, <laughs> dated 1975 uh, from the Deerstalker Press in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, dedicated to Dan Pisnansky and Irene Adler. Uh, Rosemary, what what the heck happened to uh, to precipitate this publication and the situation about which you wrote? Well, as we were talking about in the first part of the program. Um, there is a great Sherlockian collector, his name is Dan Pisnansky, and I was acquainted with him through my work at the Widener Library. At the time, with my first library job, I was processing books donated to the library. One day, um, when Dan came in to purchase some Sherlock Holmes uh, books that we had set aside for him as part of the work that we did there, um, we set aside things for many scholars, including Dan. Um, uh, he said to me, gosh, Rosemary, it's too bad you're not a man. And I said, what? <laughs> Why would you ask that? Now, you have to remember, at the time, I was a person who probably came across as shy, retiring, um, not, not you know, someone uh, that Dan knew very well. I was just a library assistant who helped him to come across some books that he wanted to purchase. But I had found quite a few books for him so kindly. He said, he explained further and said that there was a group called the Speckled Band of Boston. It was an all-male group. And unfortunately, since I was not a man, I would not be able to go to their annual dinner. And, um, but isn't that too bad? So I just said, piped up gamely, um, uh, well, I could be a man for an evening. Well, I don't think he really took me seriously at the time. But he did think that he might like to do something nice for me is my speculation. And so he sent me an invitation, and I would be his guest. I suspect very much that he really thought that this shy, retiring little thing was not going to rise to the occasion, but like him, would collect the material and treasure it. He did not know, however, (laughs) that I had an ace in the hole, and that was my Uncle Leo, who was a properties director for the great Broadway producer, David Merrick. So I called my Uncle Leo and I said, I need to be a man for an evening at a Sherlock Inn event. And he said, you know, it was a somewhat academic group, you know, I, and I'm going to be within their company. I'm not going to be on stage. I'm going to be having dining with them. And he said, oh, Rowie, which is my nickname, Rowie, I don't know. <laughs> But he said, but I'll help you. <laughs> you see, he thought I was shy, too. So anyway, he had me measure every inch of myself. And he had a complete set of man's clothing made for me. Um, gentleman's clothing, I should say. Um, everything from shoes and socks to a deerstalker hat for my head. 
He gave me lots of tips on how to behave as a man, some of them quite amusing, um, and also how to um, work at lowering my voice. Um, he did tell me that um, I was not going to come across as a very manly guy, which I already knew. I was not going to come across as macho. But in an academic setting, I might be able to pull it off at least briefly. And um, <laughs> so one of the things that was most amusing and turned out to be most helpful was that he said that um, you have to remember that unless you really blow it um, and giggle very girlishly or anything like that, if you at all might be considered to be a man, no one is going to challenge you because that would be so terribly insulting if you actually were a man and someone to say, I don't think you're a man, you're a woman. I mean, just, he said, remember that. In the meantime, he also said, um, uh, gave me all kinds of tips of things to do that would help me. And um, in terms of lowering the voice, which people often ask about, he said, think about what you would do if you had to project your voice across a room. That kind of lowering of your voice is what you will do um, in this situation, not lowering your voice like this, where you can imagine, as I'm talking to you right now, my chin would have to go down near to my chest. So he said, no, you don't want to do anything like that. Well, this is all is all very exciting um, and, um, and probably uh, beyond exciting, uh, hair-raising to poor Dan Poznanski when he showed up that evening and sure enough, there I was dressed as a man. <laughs> It didn't look that promising as he drove me into Boston and he kept saying, now, how are you going to speak? And I would just giggle girlishly. <laughs> we will, we parked far from the, the venue where the, this uh, tennis and racket club in Boston where, where the dinner was to be held. And I think he was kind of hoping I'd, I'd crumble. But he, did, he was sweet and he didn't want to force that to happen. But if it did, it might not be such a bad thing. <laughs> Anyway, um, he even took me into a fast food joint, which was awfully well lit, and uh, with the idea that maybe we should have something to drink. And the last thing I wanted to do was have anything to drink that would necessitate bathroom use later. So I went in with him. I accompanied him. But luckily, within that place, there was a gay man who made a pass at me. <laughs> and I thought, I'm golden. <laughs> <laughs> so that was nothing but confidence inspiring. Did, now, I have to say, when I went there, I did think as I entered the tennis and racket club, and there were all these really wonderful men there, um, all very enthused about the genre and about the great detective, the canon, all of it. Um, when I walked in, I really did think I'd probably last something like a half an hour if I was lucky, if I was kind of quiet and stayed in the shadows. But when I came in, there was um, uh, lots of congenial uh, conversation. I found that I could uh, have some sort of a reliable lower voice, kind of like this. And <laughs> and I had a, a, a feeling that, well, I might last more than half an hour. The other amusing thing was that um, as I entered the room, I saw a man across the room who I will never name, but he was to me, extremely attractive. And I remember thinking, I've got to stay clear of him because it's just one of those things. <laughs> he, will, he will recognize that I'm, I'm a woman as anyone will. So I, I didn't stay clear of him. I did follow my uh, uncle's tips, and um, they included being very casual in my speaking, um, not doing all the eye contact that women typically do with men. Um, uh, being uh, careful not to have my hands in view a lot, um, uh, uh, basically never walking a distance, not that I was going to go wiggling across the room in some kind of a female sexy manner, but apparently that sort of thing could be a giveaway. Hmm. The idea was to not let anything feminine, feminine about me add up too much. So as the evening went on, I was doing just fine and truly enjoying not being recognized as a woman. It was very relaxing even, <laughs> especially after I'd surpassed my half hour 
goal of lasting for half an hour. In fact, at one point when all these gentlemen were making lots of toasts to people in the Sherlockian canon, one of them made a toast to Irene Adler. And I stood up and said, hear, hear. I think Dan was ready to fall through the floor. But even then, no one challenged me. Hmm. (laughs) So I was the woman without them knowing it. (laughs) So it was really, really a a fantastic evening. And, you know, after that, um, I found that that, um, any challenge that I had in my life, any kind of a thing that might make me shy or where I'd feel um, nervous about meeting someone perhaps, I would always think to myself, if I could be a man for an evening, this is nothing. <laughs> and it built my confidence and it changed my life. It really changed my life. But it was wonderful. <laughs> we did not reveal my identity that evening as a woman. I thought Dan would do that, but he chose not to. And in reference to him as my person who had invited me there, I went along with that. Um, and um, I did... Um, for fun, put together a um, small printing of the a little booklet you mentioned, the Second Adventure, the Speckled Band, dedicated it to Dan, and uh, but we kept that even under wraps for a long time. <laughs> um, I began to see that the organization was really honoring, as you put it so nicely, the wishes of fo- of the founders, and um, I also did not want to at a time when when. Um, uh, what when feminists could be very strident? My goal, I was, I am, a, and was a feminist, but that was not my goal in this, in this occasion, to be any kind of a criticism of this organization. I actually could understand why people would want to have the feeling that they were in a gentleman's club among gentlemen. Mm. I just wanted to pull off a caper. <laughs> <laughs> And 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 you did. Now there was there was one individual, maybe it was Doctor Constable, uh, who uh, seemingly caught on and said something to Dan that I think Dan recounted uh, at the band meeting. Something like there being a uh, not not a fox in a hen house. Or, or, what, do you do you recall what it well, was? It was? Yeah, there were two things. It was it was actually um, what happened was. Um, one of the uh, gentlemen I was sitting with, and that was not Dr. Constable, it was another gentleman um, who was a doctor, medical doctor. Okay. Um, he, um, uh, it was clear to me after a while that he had stopped talking with me, not pointedly, but enough that I noticed it. He stopped engaging with me and giving me eye contact. And I, I had the impression that he had recognized that I was a woman. And or at least had strong suspicions uh-huh. and did not. He it rather pleased him was the feeling I had. And he did not want to be the one to break my cover by making me giggle or in conversation with him, give myself away. So he, that was a very, a, a very um, positive uh, recognition. And I, I felt he did know later on at the close of the proceedings, um, there was a note sent up to the person closing the proceedings and it was read aloud and it said, uh, is it possible or something like that? Or some of us believe there's, or one of us believes there's a cuckoo in our nest. And I looked around <laughs> as perplexedly as anyone else, but, but no one pointed to me. And, um, so we left. I will admit I, I was a little, um, hoping that I would have been revealed in a positive way at the end, but, when I wasn't, I, over the years, discovered that um, I had become a kind of a mysterious legend, which was even better. <laughs> <laughs> you, re- you really had. Uh, there, were, there were some of us who knew who it was. There were others who just mm-hmm. talked about this situation, uh, again, just marveling <laughs> at it, that, uh, that this was pulled off and, uh, and wondering how it, might, how it might resolve itself over the years. <laughs> well, you know, there was there was the the uh, along those lines, there was a gentleman I mentioned before who I had felt attracted to when I entered the <laughs> the meet, the uh, dinner um, at the tennis and racket club in Boston, and 
Um, about 25 years after this uh, dinner had occurred, I, f- I got a phone call. I was then working at the Boston Herald, and I used to get phone calls from all kinds of people. And a man with a very distinctive and forthcoming kind of voice said, is this Rosemary Herbert? And I said, yes, yes, and then may I help you? And he said, were you, uh, uh, by chance, in attendance at this dinner of the Second Band of Boston in 1975? And I said, well, yes, how would you know that? And he said, well, then, we just have to meet for dinner. And I thought, well, okay. I said, are you a member of the organization? Yes, I am. So, okay. <laughs> So I met him in this absolutely wonderful restaurant in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And when I walked in and we got to talking, he, I, I, as soon as I walked in, I recognized that he was a gentleman who had, I thought was so attractive <laughs> at that time. <laughs> and we both smiled at each other and he said, oh, I am so relieved. That was the one time that evening was the one time in my life that I doubted my sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And we became great friends. <laughs> That's wonderful. How wonderful is that? It was just really quite amazing. <laughs> well, I I really like the the lesson that you took from this where you said it this situation and pulling this off gave you just great confidence in your life because when you go back to what you told us about the Oxford Companion and how you volunteered mm-hmm. yourself for that project. Um, that's not something you would typically hear of someone who is uh, filled with self doubt or, uh, you know, perhaps is a little demure in nature, uh, would do. Uh-huh. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that. Uh, that Dan put you up to this and that it built your self-confidence <laughs> and that it led to something as uh, massive uh, an undertaking as the Oxford Companion. Oh, well, I'm grateful I didn't to have a thought of that way. And I should say that another huge plus to all of this is the, the wonderful people that I've met through, through that organization. Um, it's just a, a lovely, gentlemanly, fabulous group. <laughs> So it was quite wonderful. But yes, I think that um, since then, I've I've interviewed world leaders and all kinds of people and had to ask them questions. I once had a a um, column for the Boston Herald that was called On the Hot Seat, where I had to ask people in the news uncomfortable questions. And I could do that in part because of that evening that I where I felt if I could be a man, this is nothing. I <laughs> talked to Bob Dole, the man in the moon, you name it. (laughs) (laughs) So it's been pretty wonderful. I'll say, I'll say. Well, um, (laughs) as, as we wrap up here, what, um, what publication would you like to point people towards if they want to do some more reading, uh, in, in projects that you were involved in or that you, uh, you wrote yourself? Where, Where should we tell people to go? Well, um, I think that um, some of the anthologies that I have are a nice uh, entry into um, the uh, literary genre, especially for people who have have particular favorites. Um, so the new omnibus of crime, which I um, co-edited with Tony Hillerman, is one. And then, of course, I always want the opportunity to mention my mystery novel, Front Page Teaser, a Liz Higgins mystery, which is set in Boston in the world of tabloid journalism. And one of the things that I'm very concerned with at this time in history is the um, importance of the role of journalism in our society. So um, I even even dedicated the book to librarians and journalists who keep freedom of information alive for us. Mm. Um, But that one is fun because it uh, contrasts the coverage of a tabloid newspaper like the Boston Herald with the rather more staid coverage of a uh, larger spread newspaper um, that would be uh, represented by the Boston Globe. Of course, I made my newspapers fictional. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Well, we will have links to uh, both the new omnibus of crime and front page teaser, a Liz Higgins mystery in our show notes, as well as all the other 
uh, publications and some more uh, that we talked about on the show. Rosemary Herbert, thank you so much for joining us on oh. My Hero of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, it's been a joy to talk with you, Scott, and thank you all very much for listening, <laughs> all who do. <laughs> uh, thanks, Rosemary. Best Sherlockian regards. <laughs> uh, and the same to you. It's interesting, isn't it? If you had told me that we were going to talk to someone who many years ago had imper- a woman who had impersonated a man to visit the a speckled band meeting back in back in those days, I don't know what I, I never would have expected. Um, it's I mean it's so interesting, you know the the preparation, the thinking about putting on that particular persona, handling discussions. But in a way, you know, it's a lovely Sherlockian thing because it's it's without an element of menace or criticism. And, um, you know, I, that's a part of it that I really like. I'm very glad. It was such a lovely experience for Rosemary. You know, I'm, I'm glad you said that because although there may have been a little bit of uh, of a rumble of dissension among the, rant, uh, the, the, the ranks that evening in 1975, I think it was, it, it was largely uh, relegated to fun, and certainly Dan and uh, Rosemary uh, being in on the joke, um, and, and that it was it was taken at least between the two of them as something in great fun. Uh, that's that's what it's really about. And now, you know, having the benefit of hindsight, being able to look back on it and to, and to share the full story as Rosemary did, uh, that's that's really the wonderful element about it. You know, she, she didn't get a chance to mention this, I don't think, in her retelling of it. But the thing that gave her away to the individual that kind of suspected that something was going on was that her ears were pierced. She was not wearing earrings, but uh, the piercings were visible. And it was something at that level of detail uh, that a Sherlock Holmes fan was able to pick out. So... Uh, <laughs> Just entirely consistent with uh, who we are, I guess. Yeah. Well, Holmes paid great attention to ears, as we know. So that's uh, very appropriate. That's right. And and again, that's why uh, Rosemary had to keep her hands uh, not visible for as much of the evening as possible, because hands were of great interest to Holmes and, and showed a lot of detail. Excellent. Well, we have the privilege to welcome back Matthias Bostrom in his regular spot here. We took a hiatus in the last episode, but he's back with another episode of As We Go to Press, and he's got a scoop for us. The press is a very valuable institution if one knows how to use it. I must make something of it, although I've no doubt that every newspaper in London will be on the street with a full and detailed account. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. This is As We Go to Press with Matthias Bostrom. I find all sorts of things when I'm randomly searching the newspaper archives. This time I was certain I had made a minor scoop. A Sherlock Holmes play from 1900, which wasn't even to be found in Howard Ostrom's extraordinary lists of all the Sherlock Holmes actors in history. The random date generator had given me 17th of May 1900. So what could we find about Sherlock Holmes on that very date? Holmes was supposedly dead, and the Hound of the Baskervilles was still one year away. But there was a lot about Sherlock Holmes in the press, all thanks to William Gillette and his famous play. I found an article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle on 17th of May, directly connected to the Gillette success. In Brooklyn, there was a dramatic club called the Jesters, with former Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute students, and they were known to perform very humorous entertainment. This time, at the Park Theatre, 
they appeared in a three-act travesty on Gillette's Sherlock Holmes, which the former students called Padlock Holmes, that is, Holmes without the L. The existence of this kind of travesty really shows what a success Gillette's play was at the time. All of the characters were parodic versions of the names of the characters in Gillette's play. Sidney Prince had become Kidney Mins, and so on. In the travesty version, Padlock Holmes is made to have a weakness for drinking kerosene oil instead of Sherlock Holmes' cocaine habit. The theatre group even had their own cigar light scene at the Stepney gas chamber, like the one in Gillette's play. But here the professor yells to his men to follow Padlock Holmes by the smell of his cigar after every light has been put out. When the lights go up once more, Padlock Holmes is discovered at the doorway, while the professor's crew is wildly beating at a piece of Limburger cheese. The actor playing Padlock Holmes, Guy Homer Hubbard, gave, according to the review, a very fair imitation of William Gillette's acting. When Padlock Holmes was played again in November the same year, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle said that Hubbard had copied Gillette's low monotone and mannerisms nicely. Hubbard was 26 years old and had, after graduation, worked in advertising business with his father. He later became editor of three magazines concerned with ready-to-wear garments for women and children. There have been all sorts of Sherlock Holmes actors through history. The female parts were all played by men. Mrs. Larrabee, in the travesty version, was played by Sterling B. Beardsley, a 200-pound Harvard football player. And according to the newspaper, he made a stunning-looking woman. During the First World War, Beardsley gained the nickname The Average New Yorker in the press dispatches. He was by then a 42-year-old cotton broker, but really wanted to do something for his country, so he joined the Red Cross and sailed to France in 1918. He set up a very popular soup kitchen in the fighting zone and won the French Cross for his untiring efforts. The play was written by Theodore B. Sheldon and Robert B. Smith. Smith was 25 at the time, and younger brother of the most prolific of all American state writers, Harry B. Smith, who wrote 300 librettos and 6,000 lyrics. The younger brother, Robert B. Smith, also became a successful librettist. I love researching old amateur productions, just to see what happened to those actors, playwrights and others. Those stories really give life to an old, forgotten production. However, this play wasn't as forgotten as I had thought. After my research, I just checked Howard Ostrom's lists once more, and, of course, he had already found it. I had just missed it the first time. The importance of checking everything twice is what makes better research but less scoops. Oh, I love it when someone can pull off a surprise like that that's over a century in the making. I guess <laughs> pe people aren't aren't flocking to the century-old newspaper clippings the way they used to be. <laughs> no, to the disappointment of some reference librarians, but there you are. <laughs> Well, this is normally when, when you would hear those dulcet tones leading into the canonical couplet. And because of uh, vacation timing and our recording dates, we do have to put a brief hold on the canonical couplets quiz uh, for this episode. What we will do is we will pick up in the very next episode with uh, the the solution to the canonical couplet from episode 172, which means you have an additional couple of weeks to work it out. So if you haven't done that yet, go back and listen to episode 172. 
and take a crack at solving the canonical couplet quiz. And we will be back in the very next episode with another entry. Oh, good. Something to look forward to. Yeah. And in the meantime, we have something else to look forward to, which is the next episode, 174. With any luck, we will be getting down and dirty with a certain editor and author and talking about an additional iteration of Sherlock Holmes' story. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I still identify as Scott Monty. And according to my thorough disguise, I seem to be Burt Wolder. I recognized you, even under that mustache. <laughs> oh, if only I were a man. <laughs> and together we say, The, the Game's Afoot! <laughs> the, the Game's Afoot! I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.